One of my favorite camera systems, the Leica SL system, has just reached its third generation. The Leica SL3 has officially been revealed, and I've had the pleasure of trying the camera out for a few days, seeing how familiar it feels to the SL2, and more importantly, what changes we're getting as we dive into this third generation. There's a lot to get into with this camera, and I want to try to cover as much of it as I can and give as much information as I can in one video. So I'm going to be using chapters that are listed down below. Feel free to jump around and get to the information that you want the most, or if you don't want to miss any of it, then just settle in with a cup of coffee, maybe two cups. We'll start off by looking at the specs and what's actually inside the camera, the things that are really going to make a difference for the photographer or filmmaker. The SL3 has a brand new full frame backside illuminated sensor with Leica's triple resolution that we see in the latest generation of M and Q systems. You can choose between 60 megapixels, 36 megapixels, or 18 megapixels, both in DNG and JPEG format, all utilizing the entire full frame sensor. Now, as opposed to 14 stops on the SL2, the SL3 has 15 stops of dynamic range, and the ISO range has also been extended. The ISO now goes from 50 to 100,000, with the native ISO being ISO 100. Being an SL2 user for years for weddings and portrait work, one of the main things about that camera that I really wanted to see them upgrade in the future is the autofocus system, and I'm happy to say that they have done that. The SL3 uses a hybrid autofocus system, something similar to what we've seen in the Q3, although this does perform even better than the Q3's autofocus. It utilizes phase detect, object detection, and contrast autofocus, all three of these combined giving us the best autofocus we've seen in an SL camera. But the one aspect of autofocus that I really felt needed to be updated was for video. When I would use the SL2 to record my YouTube videos, I would often feel like I needed to stay really, really still and not move around too much, or I would have to, you know, constantly be checking my monitor to make sure I was in focus, or I would just set the focus manually and just stay in one place. Doing some tests with the SL3 filming myself as if I were using it to record a YouTube video here, the autofocus is drastically better than it was on the SL2. I found that increasing the sensitivity and the speed in the menu really helps with this, but you can fine tune that however you'd like. The SL3 is equipped with Leica's Maestro 4 processor with L2 technology, so this is going to give us better dynamic range, better noise reduction, as well as 8 gigabytes of memory buffer as opposed to 4 gigabytes of memory on the SL2, which use their Maestro 3 processor. While the SL2 featured dual SD card slots, the SL3 features one UHS-2 SD card slot and one CF Express Type B card slot. Me personally, I only own SD cards and I like the consistency of just having one card type, especially if I'm shooting things redundantly and I'm recording to both. However, the CF Express type cards, those are going to have much faster data speeds, which is really going to come in handy for some of the video codecs on the SL3. The battery type is the same battery that we see in the SL series and the Q series now. They share the same battery. However, it's shipping with the new updated battery that we first saw with the Q3. It's the SCL6 battery, which is a 2200 milliamp hour battery. So same size battery, it just has more juice to it. There haven't been any changes to the EVF of the camera. It's still the same 5.76 million dot OLED EVF with a 120 frames per second refresh rate. For video shooters, the SL3 allows up to Cine 8K resolution with plenty of different codecs to choose from, everything from H.265 up to Apple ProRes. Some great news about all of the resolutions and codecs to choose from, all of the frame rates, Everything that you can shoot with this camera, it's all accessible to record internally. That means you don't have to use an external monitor or an external recorder in order to access some of those frame rates or resolutions. Everything can be done just in the camera itself, which is great if you're wanting to keep everything nice and light and just shoot with the camera itself. No extra accessories required. You can also create up to five different video profiles, which is really handy for people who are going to be shooting a number of different frame rates or resolutions. You can have basically presets dialed in, have five different profiles to choose from. It makes it really easy to bounce back and forth without changing everything independently. If you have a certain you know combination that you like to shoot with, just assign it to a profile and it's just easy to switch back and forth between them. No matter what frame rate or resolution you're using, there is no recording limit to the SL3. As long as you have enough power to the camera or storage that you're recording to, you can just keep recording, doesn't matter how long it goes. 
Another feature that video shooters are really going to appreciate is the addition of a timecode sync up here on the side of the viewfinder. For large projects where you have a number of different audio sources, that's going to make syncing all of your audio much easier. All of the inputs on the left side of the camera are still here. We've gone from a full-size HDMI 2.0 to an HDMI 2.1, a USB-C input for power delivery or charging, and a 3.5 millimeter in and out for your microphone and headphones. If you're familiar with the SL2 system, specifically like the menu system and you've used the camera a lot, it's gonna feel very familiar, but also different. The entire user interface of the camera has been completely overhauled. Every individual icon that you will see in this camera has been completely redesigned, both for the sake of consistency as well as just being easier to read, whether it's in the EVF or on the LCD display. You can really pack your display with tons of different information as you're looking through the viewfinder, or if you'd rather just strip everything away and just have the image on screen, all of that is completely customizable and up to you. Another nice new feature is that when you're shooting with the camera and you rotate it 90 degrees, if you're shooting in portrait orientation or landscape orientation, the information, the user interface, all of that is going to change in real time with the camera. So no matter which orientation you're shooting, everything is easy to read and see on the screen. The menu system now also uses two different colors to help distinguish which mode you're in. Whether you're in photo mode or video mode, the menu is going to have different accent colors. When you're in the photo mode, you'll see red accents on the menu, and when you're in video mode, you'll see yellow accents in the menu. They didn't just choose yellow at random for the video features. This is actually a nod to the light cine lenses where the distance scale is always in yellow. Uh, there are no coincidences when it comes to Leica's design choices. Everything is intentional, which I like that. Of course, all of the function buttons on the camera are still customizable, and it's really easy to do that. All you do is long press on a function button. That's going to pull up an entire list of options for you to choose from that you can set that specific button to. Not only the physical buttons on the camera are customizable, but also the options in your main menu are now customizable. With the SL2, all of the bottom buttons on the main menu weren't customizable, but now with the SL3, you can assign any of these buttons to some of the main features or functions that you would regularly want access to. You can assign those directly to the main menu now. And just like the physical buttons, you just simply long press on the screen. That's going to pull up a list of options and you can choose what you want from there. It's incredibly intuitive and I love seeing stuff like that now on the screen, not just on the physical buttons. But now that we've covered what's changed with the user interface and the things inside the camera, I want to talk about the physical changes to the camera itself because immediately when I picked this up out of the box, I could feel that there was a difference and that's for a few reasons. They've shaved off 80 grams of weight in the body itself. It's three millimeters shorter in height and five millimeters shorter in width. And just hearing those specs or seeing those specs on a sheet, it probably seems like that's no real significant difference at all. And I fully get that. But in the hand, you can immediately feel and see the difference if you're used to using the SL2. I used the SL2 camera for years and it was immediately noticeable to me. If you've never used the SL2, all you need to know is they've made the body slightly smaller and also lighter, which is a good thing. But being an SL2 user for years, I could immediately feel the difference also because of the depth of the body. Going from the front of the body all the way to the back here, we now have this little lip that kind of sticks out a little bit. So the depth of the body, the way the grip feels, I could feel a difference there. On the SL2, it was just completely flush. Now with this lip here, uh, we have that because they've redesigned the back of the camera, mainly this tiltable display. Just like the Q3, when they added the tiltable display, I mentioned it in that video, Leica is making the best, most robust, strong feeling tiltable displays to the point that, and this was demonstrated to me, I didn't just find this out on my own, but I mean, you can completely hold this camera by its tiltable display and it's completely solid. I have no worries about doing this. Do that at your own risk, but I do that to show this thing is incredibly solid. And an important note about this tiltable display, despite adding this and completely changing up the body, you know, having a ribbon exposed in the back here, this camera still has an IP54 weather rating, which is unheard of. This is the only 
full frame camera on the market today with a tiltable display that still has an IP54 weather rating. A lot of cameras out there will say that they're, you know, slightly weather resistant or that they can handle the elements and there's never really clear information on exactly how weather resistant they are. Having an official IP54 weather rating is nice to see in a camera like this. And as I mentioned, adding the tiltable display, just like on the Q3, that's changed up the entire rear of the camera just a little bit. So now the three buttons that were previously on the left of the display, now everything is over here on the right, which I actually like because now everything that you really need access to is accessible with your thumb with just one hand. So to me, that just makes more sense. There is also a new button on the back of the camera and that's the power button. They've gone from a power switch that was on the SL2 to this power button. And at first I thought, is there even like a reason for that? Is it just an aesthetic choice? Why would they make a change like that? Turns out it also does have a nice function to it. When the camera is on, if you hold in the power button, that's going to completely power the camera down. However, if you just press the button once, it's going to put the camera into sleep mode. So it's not going to completely power the camera down, but it is going to be putting it into sleep and consuming less power as a result of that. So you're going to save a little bit on battery life. But why not just turn the camera completely off if you're concerned about battery life? Well, if the camera is in sleep mode and you turn it back on either by pressing the button again or just lightly pressing on the shutter release button to wake it up, it's going to wake up much faster and be ready to shoot much faster as it would if you actually powered the camera down completely and then started it back up. With a simple on off switch, there is no choice for that. You actually have to turn the camera completely off itself and then boot it back up. So you'll see the difference in real time there. And I understand and appreciate why they went with a change like this. It also makes it incredibly easy to see when the camera is charging, when it's plugged in or when it's fully charged. While the camera is charging, the little ring around the power button is going to be pulsing a green light. And then when the camera is completely charged, it will just stay illuminated in green. And finally, the last major change of the camera body itself, this glaring addition up here on the top left of the camera, we now have another dial physically on top of the camera, something I didn't expect or even think of. But now after using it, I'm super happy that they added this to the camera. With the SL2, I would have the shutter speed dial set to this little thumb wheel in the back and my aperture set to the top dial up here on the right. Then my ISO, anytime I would need to change that, the third variable in the exposure triangle, I would have it set to one of the function buttons. So typically I would have this top right button right here, press the function button once, scroll to the right ISO that I want, and then press it again. Now, having this just right out of the gate, having my ISO easily accessible, no extra buttons needing to be pressed or anything, it's all controlled right here much quicker. Uh, it's really, really nice to have that. You can also customize these dials however you'd like. It doesn't have to be ISO, it could be exposure compensation. You could swap these around. You can even kind of have these set up depending on what type of lens you're using. If you're adapting lenses like an M lens, you can have them set up for just that. Then if you attach a native autofocus lens, that, that will itself have its own sort of preset configuration. The point is, it's all customizable and it's a welcome addition to have the entire exposure triangle all accessible with just these three dials here, no buttons needing to be pressed. The SL3 is going to retail for $69.95, which is the same price as the SL2 right now. So I'm not sure how that's going to affect the price of the SL2 moving forward, but I was happy to see that this came in at the same price and not something higher. Leica is also releasing some accessories for the camera, including a dual battery grip, a dual battery charger that actually uses USB-C, plenty of power adapters for international uses, as well as a dummy battery with USB-C pass-through for longer photo or video sessions where you won't need to worry about power at all. They've also got a leather hand grip and shoulder strap they're releasing that will have quick releases built into them. Lots of exciting stuff coming out with the SL3. I was able to use this camera with the 90mm Apo Summicron. I, in all of the years that I used the SL2, I never tried any of these Apo Summicron lenses, primarily because they've been out of my budget. I would spend most of the money on the body, and then I would use other lenses on the camera itself. Just being able to shoot with this lens for a few days, uh, it's unreal. If you ever have an opportunity to try one of these Apo lenses, 
I was blown away. It's an amazing match for a system like this. They completely outresolve even the 60 megapixels. Uh, just a quick note that these lenses are incredible. I only had the camera for a few days. I've got to send it back to Leica this afternoon after I get done recording this video. I really would have loved to, you know, spend more time with it, take it to different locations, and really put it through its paces. Uh, Molly right now is recovering from surgery. She's doing great, so no worries or anything, but I've been here at home taking care of her and all of the kids, so my time and things that I could do with the camera have been very limited, uh, so that's unfortunate, but I wanted to try and just relay as much of the information about the camera as I could, so I hope this video was helpful. Thank you so much to Leica for allowing me a few days with the SL3. It's always a privilege and a pleasure to check out some of the new things that they have coming up before the launch. Um, I was actually invited to Leica HQ in Wetzlar, Germany for the launch of this camera, but as I mentioned with Molly's recovery and everything, I was needed here at home. Leica was incredibly understanding of that, so I appreciate the offer anyway. One of these days, I will make it out there. It's got to happen. That's it for this video though. If you have any questions about the SL3, let me know in the comments down below. I'll try to answer as much as I can. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope it was at the very least helpful in learning more about the camera, but that's it for today. So thank you all for watching. I love you guys and I'll see you soon.